The world of theater is full of stars. But just like in the night sky, sometimes we don't see them all. Some are in the wings, some are maybe up over us in the catwalk. Hopefully they're not under the stage, but um, you never know. In this series, we are going to meet those hidden stars of the theater, hear their stories, and be inspired by them. So join me on this journey here in my state-of-the-art production studio in my backyard as we meet the hidden stars of theater. Hey everyone and welcome back to my trailer right here in my backyard in Oklahoma. It is so good to have you wherever you're from, whether you're in Florida or California or New Zealand. We've got some, some people in England that watch this. Somebody even told me in uh, in in Turkey, we have some uh, an English speaking school that uses our program to learn English. How cool is that? It's called English Learning English Through Theater. I think it's brilliant, and the fact that they're watching us is so cool. They're going to be excited today because we have an incredible guest, somebody that represents um, uh, one of the disciplines in theater that we haven't yet spoken with, which is so cool, and it's it's kind of extra cool for me because I dabble in this. I'm a total hack and a total amateur, and who we have today is the complete other end of the spectrum because she is like not just not just good she's great and she is not just a professional she's at like the top tier of professionals so without further ado let me introduce you to our guest today anna luizos anna welcome to the hidden stars of theater thank you jamie it's a pleasure to be here Ah, uh, well it is our privilege it absolutely is and and i think i mentioned to you i i will have a hard time not being a fanboy uh, just because um, I've seen some of your sets that you have designed, and she is a scenic designer. I, I, I see. I'm already, I'm already flustered. I'm flustered, oh. <laughs> right? But uh, Anna is a scenic designer on that little street called Broadway, and I won't steal the, the, the stories, but she'll share with you some of the shows, and and there'll be shows you've heard of, and you'll go, what, Wait, what, what, what? Mm -hmm. um, incredible, and such a talent, and so creative. And just a great story, as all of our guests have. And that's what we're going to do today. But first, let me welcome you to our program, folks. Hey, we love you. You know what? You're creative, too. You're talented. And there's no reason why someday you can't be doing what she's doing. So if you like scenic design, you, you, you like that aspect of what we do in this thing called theater, listen close, get out your notebook, take some notes. Um, you know, your teacher may have you do homework on it anyway. So it's good to take those notes. But even if not, man, jot this stuff down because the wisdom she's going to share, it's golden. It's absolutely golden. And uh, Anna, have I built you up enough? You said to you know, build you up really good. Was that? Yeah, that's quite a buildup, I have to say. <laughs> I hope I can live up to it. It could be a Tony Award winning buildup. Uh, yeah. Probably yeah. not. Yeah. yeah, not right now, anyway. Not right now. Not right now. <laughs> Although, I, yeah. So um, I'm just going to, uh, you know, we, we don't have a lot of time and I don't want to waste any more of it. Uh, sure. By me talking, I want to hear your story because you are our hidden star of the day, right? And and of course, Anna, you are a known star. I mean, you're, you know, I mentioned your name and people are like, you're talking to who? Excuse me? <laughs> um, but the, the premise is you don't get to take a bow. And that's, you know, that's what we like to talk about on our show. All those people, there's performers are great. The actors are great, but they get to be out of the light and take a bow. And so um, we just want to hear from you and, and learn from you. So if you'll tell us your story, because that's what we love to do, um, kind of beginning at the beginning with the things that really influenced you, the people, the places, the things to be involved in this beautiful thing that we love uh, called theater, the theater. Mm -hmm. So uh, the stage is yours. I will just turn it over to you and enjoy. I'm going to enjoy. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I, I, it depends. I suppose I could, I could talk forever about this because, uh, you know, I'm, I've had quite a bit of uh, time from uh, my childhood till now, so uh, but it's been a, it's been an interesting uh, interesting journey. Yeah. Um, because when I was a kid, um, I grew up in a very small town uh, okay. in California, Northern California, um, uh, Marysville, California. As a matter of fact, um, we uh, you know population ten thousand people. Yes. Yeah. In the Sacramento Valley where there's not a great deal of uh, theater, I would say. So it's an interesting thing that I was intrigued by it. There was something, I, you know, 
at a very young age, there wasn't a whole lot to watch. There was just, you know, film and television and that kind of thing. But, yes. um, but when we were, uh, my father was a teacher and okay. my family is uh, of Greek origin. My father was born in Greece and he had an opportunity to go to Athens, back to his hometown and get a teaching job at, a, at an American school, a private American school. Oh, that's exciting. So, yeah, and we had been there once before when I was four years old to visit my relatives, and uh, this time it would have been it will be a it would be a year stay at least a year. So my parents sold the house, and we all uh, went across by train across to New York, and then by boat from from we took a ship from New York to. Um, Germany, and then we picked up our Volkswagen bus that my father purchased in advance, and we drove through the countryside of Europe. And so I got a, a like an education just on the journey. Cultures. Yeah, just just to see. It's almost a National Lampoon movie, right? One of the vacation movies, almost, or plane trains and automobiles. I mean, you. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and there are seeds that pretty much approximate what happened in those movies. That would. But that's, <laughs> that's another <great>. story. <laughs> um, but uh, we, yeah, we took the long way, and and. My father really felt that it was important for us to see more than just what was in our small town. That's great. And because he's from another country, he knew that there was a, another world out there. And also he was a teacher. So history was very important to him. And, um, and so we, you know, we made a lot of stops along the way. We saw historic sites and he tried to tell us stories about, you know, what happened here during World War I, World War II, you know, uh, through France and Italy and all the way across. Until we and, drove and how old were you during that journey? I was eight. Eight. Did you appreciate it at that time or is it something you look back on and think, oh. Uh, no, I did actually. I, I remembered a lot of it. And that's uh, for, yeah. Yeah, so, sometimes though, dad would go on and we'd be like, dad, we're hungry. <laughs> we want to <laughs> Absolutely. But, but, but we really got to see a lot of the world and listen to different languages and try to, you know, and my, my my father gave me the job as the as the navigator, so I got to look at the map and see where we were going. Um, That's fun. And those are the kinds of things I was always interested in, anyway. So um, we made it back. We made it all the way to Greece, and then of course we settled in. We stayed with my aunt for the summer, but then we got an apartment, and we we really lived in Athens, you know, in one of the suburbs, and uh, totally immersive. Immersed in the language, so, so you know, yeah. we had to speak the language. Um, but we went to an American school. It was a private school. And a lot of the students there were children of um, military and diplomats and, you know, foreign service. So I was exposed to kids from all, you know, all across the world. There were kids from Australia and England and Israel. And, um, and because it was a private school, uh, the curriculum was a little more advanced, I would say, and more sophisticated than what I was used to in the small you know, public school that I'd gone to, where it was yeah. very strict, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic. Uh, we had very creative classes. We had uh, creative writing classes. And, you know, I'm eight years old and we get to write books. You know, we would write these little books and illustrate them. And we got to do plays and we would take stories that were in the books and then we got to dramatize them on, you know, and create these little plays. That sounds like an amazing experience. It was great. And it really, it really, awakened something in me where I got to really be creative and, and draw and, and compose and, you know, we played music. It was great. So that, that was something that really uh, kind of awakened me to what, what I loved to do, the kinds of things I love to do. So um, after a year there, we came back to the States and moved to a small town that's right across from Marysville called Yuba City. Uh, so I uh, was in the fourth grade when we came back, and um, my first uh, experience was in the theater was this, uh, the high school was putting on a production of The Sound of Music, and um, I auditioned for one of the parts because I wanted to perform back then. That's yeah. what I love to do. So I got one of the parts of the kids, and... Uh, and we had an audience and we had, you know, people come and see the show. So I was, I loved doing that. I loved yeah. performing it. Um, you, you were bitten by the bug, as they yeah, say. Yeah, by then I was. And so yeah. after that, it was pretty much, that's kind of what I always was focused on doing. Um, th through middle school and high school, uh, you know, whenever we had a play or a musical, I always auditioned for it and, you know, got a part in it and was able to perform and. 
was anyone else in the family uh, theatrically inclined? Or uh, I'd say all three of us kids were to yeah. some degree. Um, but because I was the oldest kid, I think, you know, I was the one who was the first to, to, to do all these things. Um, and then when it came time to, you know, go to school, to go to college, I, um, I, that was going to be my focus. I wanted to, I wanted to study theater. And so I got into a, a small liberal arts college called Mills College. It was a women's college in uh, Oakland, California. And they had a, they seemed to have a decent theater program. And plus it was just a really great looking campus and a beautiful school and it was small. So you got a lot of attention. And so um, I went there for two years and studied acting and among my academic courses, of course, but um, ultimately decided because it was um, a small college, it didn't really have a huge theater department. Um, I applied to NYU. They had an undergraduate uh, acting theater program that had various affiliations with um, the, the acting schools, the private studio schools like Lee Strasberg and Oh, yeah. Stella Adler and Circle in the Square and the NYU had an experimental theater wing. So there were various um, studio affiliations where students could study. So I chose Circle in the Square. And, and a, uh, a few more opportunities than you had at uh, Mills. Yeah. And the, <laughs> the fact that I'd be in New York City was really um, phenomenal. Yeah. A really huge uh, opportunity. So it also was a, a great way to get to New York City by being in the safety of a school. You know, I right. had a dorm, so I didn't have to worry about looking for an apartment or anything like that. You had so, you had built-in community, which I know a lot of times when people go there, that's a that's difficult tough. thing. That's a yeah. tough thing. Yeah. And I know plenty of people who've done it, you know, who've come to the city not knowing anyone and trying to find a place to live and roommates yeah. that you don't know. That's really hard. But um, so I chose a way that I that I knew at the time would, would be something I could manage. Had you been to New York um, much before, or was it? I had uh, never been to New York. Had never been there. Not what? as a, no. I mean, when we were traveling through to go to yes. Europe, we spent the night in the hotel, but that yeah. was it. Yeah. So, you know, I tried to read about New York and try to orient myself, you know, looking at the maps. <laughs> and this is before the internet, by the way. So, um, a little, before, a little before, culture shock? Before Google, before anything. All of that. Um, you know, I, it was great. I it actually seemed smaller than I expected it. I was picturing, oh, wow. you know, wide streets and big boulevards, but it was, you know, everything was like, you know, two way streets and tall buildings. And uh, yep. um, it was, it was a great way to, to start to feel like a part of something. Yeah. Yeah. A safe um, acclimation. Yeah. Yeah. And that was New York in the late seventies. So it was not, the beautiful city that people see now. It was in the depression. There was graffiti everywhere. It, the streets were dirty. The The city was undergoing a major kind of bankruptcy at the time. And that was the summer before um, Son of Sam, this killer that was roaming loose. There had been a blackout uh, in the middle of the summer and there was looting and all kinds of things going on. And I remember that summer before I went to, to New York, everyone was saying, are you sure you want to go there? <laughs> yeah, the parents was, were probably, um, Anna, really? Yeah, it was a, yeah. wasn't the best time to come to New York, but it was a cheap time when you think about it. I mean, things, you know, people were fleeing the city then. There were a lot of, you know, empty storefronts and. Well, I hadn't thought about it, but it probably did make it a little less competitive to get into some place like NYU. I wonder, I don't know. I mean, now, now the university systems are so filled with students, but that yeah, was, absolutely. that was quite a while ago. Yeah. Um, anyway, it was a, it was a, a great way to get to know the city. And after my first year, I, I got an apartment with my friend and we uh, found a fourth floor walk up in a tenement building uh, in the East village, which at that time was very dicey. It wasn't yeah. a cool place. Like, it, like it's it not is what now. it is today. Huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so that was, uh, that was a great uh, place to be. Anyway, I cut to, I graduate, you know, I've <laughs> taken acting classes and all that. And, and then, you know, I did some auditions and, and, uh, but half-heartedly in a way, because I also had to make a living and pay my rent. So I had a waitressing job and, um, 
you know, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next. Um, my friends, my, my, some of my classmates, we, we put, got together and did a show. We put on a play. We found us, one of my friends wanted to be a producer. So he found the space and raised the money. Uh, another friend of mine was a director, aspiring director. He directed it. I, and I didn't want to be in it. I wanted to do the set. So I, did the set for this play. We did it in the basement of a hotel. And I had to build the set and build things in my kitchen and scrounge uh, around uh, dumpsters uh, around the, the, yeah. the, the streets to find cardboard tubes because I wanted to make uh, pipes and and things. So it was um, it was an adventure for us. Guerrilla theater, that was. Yeah, we put the show together and it, and, uh, it, it gave me a taste of what it would be to, to do the set. And well, also, you know, in, in, cla in class, we had some outside of the school projects that we did, and I assembled the set with what I could find. Yeah, absolutely. And I tell you what, I tell my students all the time that I work with, because occasionally I'll find one whining, well, there's just nothing going on. I wish there was a show to, to do. Well, and I always tell them, if, you, if there's no show, make a show. Yeah that's uh, the, the the go getters are the ones who are going to make it in this industry and don't sit around and 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 whine because you can't find something be the one that leads and and find find someone that wants to direct find you know even find a writer whatever uh there's there's plenty of other people out there that want to make art get together and so students the same thing if you if you think that your school needs to do more shows or lead it yeah. direct a show do a show yeah, yeah. in well, your backyard it turned yeah. out that among among the four of us that put this show together, we are all in the business now. See, professionally, so that just uh, proves my point. The go getters, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I would say so. You guys so, should do a reunion show. Well, I see them all the time. Oh, I don't see all of them, but I see some of them. Um, yeah. Well, actually, Natasha Katz, who was the lighting designer, had been working as an assistant for I think she was working for Ken Billington at the time. Uh, we did end up working again together. We did School of Rock together. She used the lighting oh, designer for School of Rock. <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, cut that's... to many years later. Yeah. So, uh, and actually Michael Engler, who directed it, is now directing the movie. He just directed the movie Downton Abbey. And- uh, Oh, that little one. Yeah, that, that little one. So wow. He's, he's so he, well. he was the one who directed- Our little show, That's yes. incredible. So who was the fourth? Um, I'm trying to remember who did the costumes. I've forgotten who did the costumes, but my friend who produced it is now an entertainment lawyer. Wow! And and he uh, he works with all the producers. He's he's constantly working in the theater. He's in the theater business, but in a different capacity. Well, and here's what I love: creativity begets creativity. Yes. I would love to have just been able to sit and listen because you obviously are all just incredibly creative people. How much fun those conversations must have been when you were putting that together. Yes, I know. Well, you know, we were kids, really, when you think about it. Um, but we obviously all had the interest and the passion to do what we were doing. So and the talent. Yeah. Yeah, ultimately. Yeah. Fun. And That's and the stick to itiveness, which is a big part of yeah. it, by the way. It's not just about the talent, because there are many talented people out there. It right. really has to do with just keep keeping at it, keeping persistence, at it. Persistence, persistence, persistence. Yeah, definitely. Yep. So I got good. sidetracked anyway. Huh, no, that but that was an incredible story. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. I know. It's, it's uh, You don't realize all these little things add up, you know, because if, that's what really made me think, oh, maybe I should look at doing this instead of acting. And the other thing was, when I was growing up, I didn't even know that there was such a thing as set design. I mean, it right. just, it was not something that was even in my, my, my consciousness. You know, I just thought the sets just, I don't know. They just created themselves. Who knew? Well, These you're little a kid, elves came in at night and built that. Yeah. Well, you just don't think about it when you're watching a, <laughs> you a show. You, you look at the performers and you look at the dancing and, and the spectacle around them looks great, but you don't really think that there's, there are people behind all of that. And right. of course, it takes so many people to put on a show, as we know. So, um, and being in New York, it became obvious to me that there were so many other aspects to theater. Because I, you know, you, I could see shows and I, and I knew that um, when I was in college, my teacher at Mills had said, after I'd taken a set design class, because he was offering classes 
to us when we were students there. We would also build the sets. I, you know, I was always in the in the workshop, in the scene shop, building stuff and putting the set together and hanging the lights. It was something we all did together. And I took this uh, set design class from him. And because I actually have some ability to begin with, because my father and I did stuff together, we always built things together. So yeah. I had a real interest in building things and I could draw was something I also did as a kid for a very long, long time, just, but it was a hobby. And when I used those skills in my set design class, my teacher said, you should think about doing set design. Uh, you know, NYU offers a really good set design program. And, and I thought, I said, yeah, thanks, but I'm going <laughs> to do acting. But once I was in New York, I realized, oh, there really is a program. And the class, the school was literally around the corner from my apartment in the East Village yeah. back then. <laughs> so, um, and I also had a friend who had, was in the program and I used to help her sometimes with her artwork. So, okay. so that really started to interest me after the, a year of not, you know, after we graduated. Um, so I applied, I applied to NYU to their design pro program with very little to show them, but I could show them my drawings. I could show them some sketches and pictures from the show that I, <laughs> the set that I built and they accepted me. Um, that, that's a, that's phenomenal because that's got to be a competitive program. Yeah. And I'm sure now it's much more competitive, but um, I don't know some, they saw something in me and my interest and they accepted me. Maybe it's that, and maybe that's going to be the theme of, of your life is that go, go, what did you say? I'm going to go get it. Go get her. You may, you said a word. Stick-tuitiveness. Stick-tuitiveness. That's it. I would say go get her. Yeah. Which is much harder to say. Stick to yeah, that's, that's I like that. It's a good word. Stick to it of this. That could yeah. be if if you do a, a memoirs, that's gotta be the title. Oh, I'll remember that. Thanks. Stick to it of this. <laughs> At least a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> well, very um, good. So you, you're starting then at NYU as a, in the graduate program. I got in, yes. Uh, but I caught in very late because um, okay. it was like, what am I gonna do? I'll try that. So I applied and I got in. And then it was a huge expense, you know, it's a graduate school and not nearly what it is now, but back then comparatively, it was a lot of money. And so I applied for a loan, not through the government because it was too late, but I got a bank loan and it was not enough to cover everything. And so I asked them if I could, if there's any way I could go part time. And they said, yes, they said, yes, as long as you come back and you go full time. So they offered me a chance to take, I took a, the important classes for a starter, for a beginner, drafting and model building and um, figure drawing. And so I just took art classes for the first year. And um, I didn't get to take the design, you know, theater design classes, but I feel like it was very helpful because I learned the basic skills that you really need to start with. Right. Um, but after that first year, because I had never really had my childhood, you know, geared towards this dream of being a set designer, I felt like I wouldn't be gathering as much information in the classes that I, that I should. Yeah. So, so kind I of thought. Kind of lack some foundation maybe. Yeah. So I just thought I'd be, it's a huge waste of money and a huge expense to just take art classes. So I um, took a leave of absence with the intention of going back maybe in a year. And rather than do that, I ended up assisting. I started assisting designers and my brother knew someone who was a set designer. So, you know, he introduced me and uh, he hired me to start, you know, with very basic things. And he, you know, he would say stuff like, can you do this? And I would say, yeah, I can do it. And then I would go home and try to figure out, figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. And again, pre-internet, right? Oh yeah. You couldn't just Google it like you could now. No, no, no. <laughs> this was real research. T totally. So um, I ended up working for him for, and I didn't go back to NYU, by the way, not then. Uh, I ended up working for him for five years. Oh, like, wow. I was not just him. I worked for him. I will work for other designers, you know, when people had to, you know, I'd find out that someone needed an assistant or I would reach out to designers and ask them if, they'd be, if they needed any assistance. So over the course of five years, I learned a lot. I learned from the ground up, from concept to completion, you know, coming up with an idea that, you know, the directors would come in and meet with a designer and they would have conversations. So I, I was privy to all, all of that process, which is what I didn't get. I didn't know prior to this time. So do you think it helped you then? Um, 
I mean, it's an, it's a kind of a dumb question because it probably the answer is yes, but I'll let you comment on it. Working with all of those designers, did you, were you cognitive of their process enough to say, oh, I like what they're doing there and kind of create your own over those years by learning what you thought was the best aspects of each of their individual process? Um, I wouldn't say I didn't know. I wasn't conscious of that yet. I was mainly just doing what needed to happen next, you know, that yep. I'd listen to them say, you know, have the conversation. Do this, do this, do this. And then my direct, my designer would say, okay, let's do the ground plan. Here's the ground plan. Can you elevate everything? And so he would do a ground plan and I would go, you know, we'd be in the su studio together and I'd say, so how tall do we want these walls? And where do you want the doors? And, you know, I would just draft it all. Right. And, and then build the model and we would, uh, you know, I'd consult with him and he would help me or, and then he would do sketches for some of his, um, designs uh and every designer they have different processes some right. some designers focus on just the model and make it all all the color and all the choices of surfaces are in the model other designers just do a white model and then they do paint elevations uh color elevations to show everything so everybody was different it was really useful to work for different people uh, but and let me pause one second and this will just be a learning i know what they are because i do them but some of our students won't so the term elevations yeah will be so, a new term for a lot of kids. Right. So if you could so, just give us a quick, simple yeah, explanation there. No problem. A ground plan, obviously, is a map, a flat map of what it looks like if you're, if you're looking down at the floor. And all the lines that represent the walls are, you know, you see them scribed out. What you need to do for, uh, for the shop to build the, the set is you have to take each of those wall sections and show what they'd look like if you're looking straight at them. So an elevation is a straight view of a surface. So every piece of scenery that you want to have built, you need to do an elevation to show so you so that they can measure it and it's all in scale. So that means if you're drawing it in half inch scale, half an inch equals a foot. So and there are scale rulers that actually break it down in a way that it's not just inches, but you actually can look at a half inch scale of a foot and in between those two lines you see every inch represented. It's very it's very tiny. And quarter inch is even tinier. A quarter inch Little is a bitty. <laughs> yeah. So um we had to, you know, that's part of what the job of the assistant is to 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 do all those things. Um and you know I ended up working for five years doing that. And it was like I you know I was working at the top. I was working I couldn't work on Broadway because I wasn't in the union, but sometimes I could work on a Broadway show in the studio. I just couldn't go to the theater and be part of the staff. I could maybe help out. But and I, what, what union are um, scenic designers a part of? Is it the design? The, it's um, called United Scenic Artists, USA. Yeah. And that includes set designers, costume designers, lighting designers, art directors, um, uh, art department coordinators, and scenic artists. So all those people fall under the umbrella of United Scenic Artists. And we're also affiliated with IATSE, which is the Stagehands Union. Right. So we're now a very solid, big union. And, That's uh, awesome. And what's good about the union is we have power right. in negotiating salaries, minimum wage, minimum salaries for all the different departments. There are prescribed fees for off-Broadway, oh, well, no, not for Broadway plays, there's a minimum that every designer gets paid to do a Broadway play. If it's a single set, if it's a multi-set play, there are different tiered um, fees for all those people. And then you can always negotiate higher, but there's always a basic minimum for all these. Uh, Got to meet the minimum at least. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know even, you know, for stagehands, a lot of times, one of the most important things is you get insurance, right? So there's some great Health insurance basic and advantages pension. to that. Yeah. And, and a pension. And a well. pension. So you don't just rely on your social security when you get to retirement. You actually have a pension that's been that in which every paycheck you get, a percentage of that, the producer pays towards your pension as well, on top of your salary. Oh, so that's it's, great. It's a really good it's a really good union. So anyway, um, as a you know, a, as a non union assistant I couldn't I couldn't do some of those jobs and I didn't get guaranteed any of those uh, wages. But my, you know, the designers would pay me what they could. It wasn't, a, it wasn't enough to make a living. I'll put it that way. Right. So uh, during that whole time, I worked in the restaurant business. I was a waitress. 
I, uh, and then I was a head waitress and I hired and fired people. And then, um, I also, um, started to manage a restaurant by the same, I worked for the same restaurant owner. He kept expanding and building restaurants. So I actually got to be a restaurant manager. And then I was juggling restaurant management with working on shows. Um, and I realized at some point when I was turning 29 by then that this could be my career. I could either go in the restaurant business or I could really focus on design. If I really want to do this, I could just be an assistant, which is decent. It's a, it's a respectable job. But I also had never had the opportunity to design, to come up with designs of my own. Because right. when you're assisting other people, you're doing their they're, you're doing their designs. You're executing their visions. So I which thought, some people love, right? There are people oh, who love being no, that assistant. But and yeah, it's a very steady profession, which is yeah. something you know is very uh, attractive when you want to have, you know, a real life. You want to get married and have kids and have some stability in your life. Yeah. that's that that can be a very good position to be in. Uh, but I wasn't in the union, so I I couldn't do big big jobs. Um, and so because I was managing a restaurant, I was at a decent salary and I told the, the owner, I said, I really want to go back to design school. And he, he was very amenable. He said, okay, as long as you're on call, you can, you know, do two shifts a week and then just be on call. And the thing, the thing that was great for me is I, I lived on, on the, in the East village, the restaurant was in the East village and NYU was two blocks away. So it was all very manageable for me. And, um, and I think I had mentioned to you before that when I thought about applying to graduate school, <laughs> Yale was out of the question for me, not because of any reason except that I did not want to give up my apartment in New York City. Which is a huge thing for those <laughs> who know. It's a huge thing for those who know. Absolutely. Well, but, but for plenty of people, it would never stop them. <laughs> for me, it was like I had kind of set up a life for myself. And right. one of my goals was to feel like I lived in New York City and yeah. I loved and, and I loved home. being yeah it was my home it was my life I had been there since what it had been like 12, 11 years that I had yeah. been in New York and so I didn't want to give that up and NYU was right there so I applied and of course they let me in because they you know I had been there before and uh, well, now, hold on a second you say of course they let you in because you've been there before but let me let me let me recap a timeline here. So you started in NYU. They let you in late, yeah, and agreed to let you go part time. All of those things seem to me that probably atypical. Yes. And then you said, um, "I'm going to take a little time off. I'll be back." They said, "Okay, but you got to come back in a year." Yeah, which I and didn't. you didn't. Yes. And instead, you started being an assistant designer mm -hmm. with no experience, with a little experience. Yeah. Right, a little bit of experience. Yeah. Um, and now, and that was because you got in the door because of relationship, your brother, right? But what we know is relationship only gets you in the door. Yeah, of Talent course. and ability keeps you there. And so for five years, you worked as an and assistant. I, and I learned a lot. And you learned a lot. And I learned a lot. And, and I got also gained the, I gained the confidence and the knowledge to know what I didn't know by then. But I, Absolutely. But I, but I learned... <laughs> Yeah, the reasons that you left, you had filled in those gaps. Is that fair? The like you, that I... when you, you left NYU the first time because you felt like you didn't have the background. Exactly. And so for those five years, it was building that. So you went back to NYU. Right. However, you didn't come back a year later. You didn't do what they asked of you. Right. And you come back and say, I want back in. And they said, yes. Here's my point. <sighs> yes. Everyone saw something in you that's incredible. That's it, it really. Uh, you, potential. Potential. potential, potential, absolutely. But it, but potential. I mean, talent is potential realized. Yeah. Okay. okay. And so they recognize talent. Let's be honest. Um, they did, or they would have said no, because I know uh, even in a small college it, that wasn't NYU, most of the time, if if a student said, "I'll be back," and then they don't come back, and it's a program that's competitive, they're going to say, "Sorry, you blew your chance." Right. Um, but I, what? you know. I think it's clear they saw in you some some potential, we'll say, some talent. Right. But well, one thing they did say and, and insist on was I thought, well, 
maybe I, because I took classes before, I could, you know, jump ahead and only do two years. And they said, no, you have to do three years. <laughs> I had to do the full program. But at least I jumped to the design courses right away. I didn't have to take right. drawing or any of those classes. Redo those. And I had a portfolio that showed my abilities. Absolutely. That I could, you know, could show them. And my goal was to have a portfolio of my designs by the end of those three years, which, you know, at the time was like, oh, God, I could be a lawyer after three years. <laughs> <laughs> I could be going to law school or something. Or Where would the fun be in that? Though? <laughs> Let's be honest. I'm going to design school, <laughs> theater design school. Um, and I, I wanted to get into the union. That was my other goal. Right. So um, I had a very clear purpose in going back. And I still had a job so I could pay my rent and pay my bills. And, and you had uh, stick to itiveness. Yeah, and I pulled a lot of all-nighters, though, because it's very intense. The, yeah. Back then, it was very intense. You know, you had a lot of assignments. and um, But uh, John, the, the, the man with whom I first got my dis, uh, assistant job with had a, a, a theater, a, a studio space that he started to rent and um, needed someone to share the space with him. So I jumped on board. So we were sharing a studio space by then, by the time I went to NYU. So it was great because I could do my work at my studio. Uh, I didn't have to do it in my bedroom. I could just go do it at my studio and then leave it and come home. So, Would and you... it was all within a five block radius. Everything. Wow, that's amazing. It was, it was pretty great. So you had your own little world in the big city. I did, I that's did, beautiful. yeah. So that was three years of, uh, work and hard work and stick yeah. to but getting you know i the union exams were in the spring towards the end of our our school year our third year and i went in for the union exam and back then uh, it changes uh, now it the, all the requ that's required of you if you want to apply for the union is to show them your portfolio uh, and show them what you're capable of and they either accept you or they don't based on that but you have to have certain things uh, within that uh, interview right. to, to prove that you know what you're doing. But back then, they would actually assign you a show to design. So I actually, oh, wow. yeah, I was assigned a multi-set play. We all had the same uh, play to design. So anybody who applied for that year had to do design for that, for that play. Oh, well, that, that makes it feel a little more competitive, doesn't it? Yeah, and, yeah. and you know, challenging. So do you remember I'm, what the play was? Yeah, it was Ethan Frome. Okay. Ethan Fromm. Um, so I had to do that while I was doing my classwork, you know. Um, anyway, I, I applied and I got accepted, you know, weeks later, they tell you that you're accepted. So that was, you know, I was able to check that off the list. <laughs> and then um, because I had worked uh, for, I had gotten to know some designers. One of the designers was the uh, art director of the Cosby show at the time. And so my first job at NYU was working for her on the, as the assistant art director on the Cosby show. So I ended up jumping into television right away. And, and at the time, that show was huge. I mean, you jumped oh, right yeah. into, it was in into its, television. Oh, yeah. It was sixth season at the time. Yeah. They had two more after that. Uh, so that was great. I mean, I suddenly got a, a good paying job working in television. So I did that. And then uh, the following year, I got a, 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 an offer to do another TV show. I accepted that. So I ended up working on TV, uh, TV shows for the first couple of years that I got out of uh, school. And then um, then it was still, you know, piecemeal. You know, I didn't work. I didn't work uh, in the restaurant business by then. I was you know, able to work on these full time TV shows. And then after that, some of the shows were canceled. So it became more of a where is my next job going to come from? Right. You know? And uh, that, you know, that can be very challenging, you know, psychologically, uh, financially. So you're just trying to, you know, pick up jobs wherever you can. So then I got assisting jobs on some, you know, off-Broadway plays. And then the owner of the restaurant kind of comes comes to me and says, I'm design I want to, I, I bought, I'm going to rent this space and I need to design it into a restaurant. Do you want to design it for me? And I thought, Oh, okay. I'll do That's that. Fun. That sounds fun. Yeah. yeah. Because I, obviously I had the restaurant background. I know where yeah. things, where the equipment has to go. 
So it was kind of a theme restaurant. So we, it was like a Mexican restaurant. So I got to design a Mexican village inside this building. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So that was a, a nice chunk of time that I had to just focus on that. So that's what I did. I did that for, I don't know, probably up to a, uh, it was like eight months of work. And then in the midst of it, he said, do you want to manage it for me? You could hire the staff and all this stuff. And I thought, well, maybe I'll do that for a while. So I said, yes. So we, we put the restaurant together. We hired the staff. We created the menu and did all this stuff. And, and I realized I, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm wrapped up in a completely different aspect of, of uh, uh, a different career. Right. And um, I started feeling myself drifting farther away from my dream. Mm -hmm. So within that year, I, I thought I have to go back. I have to go back to, to go back to theater because I've been, you know, taking all these different uh, detours. So um, I called up Tony Walton, who is a very, very well-known established award-winning set designer absolutely and i had met him one of the in previous years when i had worked with this other designer who had was designing the tony award so i got to work on the tony awards as the designer you know as oh, the wow. assistant to the designer assistant, yeah. and so during those times when you work on the tony awards the shows that are nominated you have to represent each of the the nominated shows somewhere on stage and so i got to go to the different designers who were nominated and say what you're doing this, which version of this set do you want us to show? And so I would adapt their scenery to the stage. Oh, that's and, fun. Yeah. And so Tony had said, I remember this because he said, if you ever are interested in uh, joining our team, let me know. I'd love to have you. And you're like, so, what? excuse me, what? <laughs> and I had remembered that. And that had been uh, years before. And so uh, I called, called his studio out of the blue and I said, um, I'm just looking to see if you might be interested in hiring anyone because I'd love to work for you. And he said, well, actually, I'm kind of busy right now. Maybe I can, I can bring you on. And so I finally said goodbye to the restaurant. I, I had to tell the owner, I said, I can't do this anymore. It's just it's not what I want to do. So I took a job working for Tony for much less money because he said, I can't pay you a lot. I said, I don't care. It's fine. Yep. So, I started working for him on this. Uh, he was doing multiple things. He was he had a tour of of um, Will Rogers Follies going out. Mm -hmm. He was in the mid, just finishing the revival of Guys and Dolls for Broadway. Oh wow! He was doing an opera for Chicago Lyric Opera, and he was working on a play at Lincoln Center. And, he, and I went to his apartment where he had this gorgeous Upper West Side apartment, with many many hallways, and many bedrooms, and ev all the assistants were working there. It was like so that was like his studio as well. His home and his studio, yeah. That's this crazy. Beautiful, uh, classic, uh, turn of the century apartment building. Wow, it's, it's a beautiful place. And um, so it was a, a a relief to be there again, to be working in a in an environment where everybody's working on something. That nervous and, energy is addictive, isn't it? Yeah, and and it was. We were. I was working on the opera. And then he got this incredible opportunity to design this um, huge production of A Christmas Carol that uh, that Alan Menken wrote the score to, and it oh, was going wow. to be it was going to be done at the Madison Square Garden Theater. And they were just beginning to start beginning the process when I was there, and they needed to hire assistants for it because it was huge because we had to transform this. What was um, they had just built this theater. Uh, it's above the train station, but it's a very strange space. Uh, they use it for these big tours. Um, I'm trying to think what, what else is played there. It's a very strange space. Anyway, Tony was charged with transforming the theater into uh, Victorian uh, London. And he needed a lot of people on board to do this. So I was one of 12 assistants where we went in and we measured the, the, the boxes along the side and, and the stage had to be transformed to Victorian London. And so um, I was one of the associates working on that. And uh, that was my biggest job to that point where I was responsible for doing all of the side boxes. We covered all the boxes with building facades and we had yeah. windows opening. And it was really spectacular. So that sounds amazing. It was a huge job. And um, so I, that was a nice long job as well. So sometimes, you know, what we end up doing is short jobs where you end up assisting somebody for a couple of weeks where they just need something to be, be done quickly or these huge projects where you get to work from the ground up. 
Yeah. And that was one so of them. That project, for instance, how, how much time do you get for a project like that? It was nine months. Oh, wow. I mean, from, from inception, from the very beginning, where it was just a little pencil sketch that he had, to the time we completed a quarter inch model that spanned probably six feet in size because it was it covered not only the stage but also the boxes it was huge um and susan stroman was the choreographer and mike oh, wow. was the director and um um uh, lynn aarons did the lyrics and alan minkin wrote the music it's a beautiful score um and then it was one of these uh musicals that came back every year at christmas i was gonna so say was it one that it, they it, tried to repeat every year every for 10 years they did it for 10 yeah. years so that was a that was a real boost to my confidence as a as an associate. So I, I was bumped up not just from assistant to an associate designer. Associate designers now have they're like the right hand person to the set designer. They are really responsible for kind of managing the rest of the assistants and um, just keeping the things on schedule, making sure things you know get done. Um, and that was a huge uh, boost for me, where I really, I really understood what my responsibilities were by then. Yeah, and especially under him. I mean, you know, yeah, this, is, I mean, he's this isn't just the someone. Best this in is, business. Yeah, absolutely. This is the man. Yeah, he's the man. Yeah. And he also the thing that distinguished him for me, and really was formative for me, was the way he treats people. He yeah. treats people with incredible respect and dignity and he's a very loving human being and um it was like it was like family when we were there i yeah. mean his wife jen was so sweet and was always happy to see us and you know she would cook, make lunch for us so <laughs> we we would you know sometimes we would just all sit around and, and she'd create this wonderful spread for us and we'd go sit down we'd take turns going into their kitchen and and just we it wasn't just about cranking out the work it was about right. relationships and that was a huge lesson for me because i and i liked the way i like working in that way and so i've 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 taken that um that spirit and i i embrace it and then and when i work now at my studio whenever when i finally had my own place my own studio that's how i like to work i we work hard but we also take the time to just enjoy a meal and allow our, the rest of our lives to, uh, to be part of what we do, you know, because if you just become, if it's all about work, then it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's not real. You know, there, there's, you know, people have lives and, and I support that. So, you know, I don't yeah. work till midnight. I like to work till six o'clock in the evening and then time to go home. Knock it off. Yeah. Well, and I know for I, I'm very much that that same process. And for me, I find that it just nurtures creativity more um, and loyalty. You know, if I have someone that I work for that is that I am more, much more apt to just I want them to succeed. Right. Because it is family. It's not just boss. Not that I don't want others to succeed, but there's just a different level of care and love and relationship there that really I'm going to go that extra hundred, whether they ask me to or not, because I want that because of that nurturing and that relationship. Yeah, that's yeah. important. It is. It is. Um, so that was a it was a wonderful thing I took away from working with Tony. Yeah. Uh, and then I got some other associate jobs on big musicals. I was working on uh, a big Andrew Lloyd Webber musical called Whistle Down the Wind that was uh, supposed to come to Broadway that Hal Prince was directing. Oh, wow. And uh, we played, we did it out of town. We did it in Washington, D.C. at the National Theater when I was working for Andy, J Andrew Jackness. He was the set designer. And um, this was going to be our big show, the big <laughs> Andrew Lloyd Webber show that was coming to New York. And um, we took months. We worked on it for like six months and built a beautiful model. And we you know, went to all the scene shops while they were building it to make sure it was all looking great. And it, all got shipped to Washington DC. We teched the show, we put it up, it ran through from the from like um, I don't know, September to December. And after the holidays it was gonna move to Broadway. The marquee was up at the Martin Beck Theater and it was gonna be my first Broadway show to work on. And um, 
Andrew and Hal had a disagreement about the production, and Andrew pulled the plug on the production. Oh, no. So it never came to New York, and all that scenery just went to the trash. Oh, and that's so heartbreaking. All those actors were, yeah, lost their jobs. And I thought, oh, it's heartbreaking for me, too. But uh, then Andrew got another uh, job doing The Scarlet Pimpernel, which was another Broadway musical that was just going to Broadway. And um, I was his associate on that. So that was another nice long stretch of work as an associate. Um, and, you know, that did very well. Um, and uh, this is the chronology of my life right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. It's great. I don't need to tell you every single thing that I did. But, <laughs> but basically, for, for the long stretch after graduate school, I was yeah. basically a better paid assistant. I was a better, and I was an associate designer. So I got to do, you know, a lot more responsible things and, you know, go to the scene shops while they're building sets and report back. And um, so it was well, And you're, meeting, you're meeting people and you're becoming yeah. trusted, right? You're building reputation. Yeah. Which is important. Yeah. And not, and not knowing what the future holds at all. You just yeah. kind of go from job to job and, um, yeah. It's just, so at what point did you begin to think, man, I'm hungry for my own show. I'm, I'm always I'm hungry for, for my own show. <laughs> I'm always hungry, but you just don't, you know, are, where the, you yeah. don't know where the opportunity is going to come. And, um, well, I'm thinking, you know, I would do something like I had friends who were doing a, a little off-Broadway show somewhere in a small theater. And then, of course, I would say yes to do doing something like that. But, you know, it's, it's a challenge because there's usually not a lot of money, so especially for the set. So, you know, you try to find maybe a carpenter who can help you execute the, the design. You don't want the design to be so ambitious that it can't be done. Right. Um, who you don't build you... a lot of automation into it. No, no automation. <laughs> no full revolve. <laughs> and, and a lot of these spaces aren't even designed. They're Big like enough. black box spaces. There's this 11 foot ceiling. You know, there's all these challenges. Uh, so, but, you know, I would, any chance I had to do something, I would, I would do it. But always thinking in the back of my mind, if I only had money, if I only had people who could build it, it could be so much better. But also you have to kind of live with the limitations that you have and work around them. So, you know, I was able to have some creative outlets doing some of these small shows. And... Um, and then uh, I'm trying to think of what the chronology is. Occasionally, there would be some um, film work, t okay. you know, TV work, movie work, um, where my friends from school would say, "Hey, we we need another drafts person. Can you come to Baltimore and do uh, do a stint for us?" And go, yeah, of course. I would say yes to anything like that because the because the pay for uh, films is so much better than theater. They like theater. Yeah, yeah, much better. Uh, especially for an assistant, you just automatically get paid a lot more. You know, if you just do. So it's, it's in the union contract. Yes. Um, so you know, I would take these various jobs, and you know, I I made a living, and then um, again, I I got sidetracked. Well, somewhat sidetracked. Uh, a friend of mine had uh, knew someone who was starting a company, a design company, where they were doing. Um, they wanted to do interior designs for, um, you know, themed interiors. Right. Which is yep. very theatrical. And it, it was towards the towards that time when people were doing themed restaurants and themed stores and all that kind of stuff. So there was something very uh, attractive about a steady job. And so I went for an interview and I, I got a job. I was offered to me. And so the company hired me. And, you know, we were, there was, the, the owners were trying to, uh, uh, solicit business and and various uh, various capacities. Uh, com maybe a commercial, maybe a, um, I don't know. There was there were. It was at a time when that that business that that whole idea of themed inter themed interiors was already waning. I think. Yeah. And so the company lasted for when I was there. It lasted for about a year, and finally they had to disband. Um, and in the meantime. I got a call from someone who was, said they were looking for art directors for um, Sex and the City. Oh, wow. 
So I went in for an interview and I got the job. Um, prior to that, though, I was doing, um, I had done some other off-Broadway shows. I, I need to backtrack a little bit before that. Yeah, that's good. Um, I was working on, um, I met this director, Scott Schwartz, who was uh, charged with doing um, this musical version of Jonathan Larson's uh, one-man show that was now called Tick, Tick, Boom. Right. And what Tick, Tick, Boom was, was it as it was a collection of his previous, when Jonathan was alive, he was trying to do this one-man show uh, that changed titles a couple of times. Tick, Tick, Boom was one of the titles. Another one was called Boho Days, about his struggle as a writer to create rock and roll music as in musicals. And obviously this is before Rent. Right. And um, after his death and after Rent became this huge success, um, the family wanted to take all of this material and try to put it together into something. So um, uh, the producer, they hired a, 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 book, a book writer, David Auburn, and he took all of this material and he assembled it into a, a different kind of show that's based on all of these different uh, versions where it wasn't just a one man show, it was a three character show. And so they created this musical Tick, Tick, Boom. And I met with the director and I got the job to design oh, nice. it. So that was my, I would say, Tick, 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 Boom in 2001 was my first off-Broadway commercial production that really had the backing of producers. Right. Prior to you that, it was more like just people you know, scrounging money together. And this you didn't have to dumpster, di dumpster dive for uh, no. set pieces, right? <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> and while I was working on that, I actually had been working on another TV show. Um, so I was getting paid a decent wage. Um, it was called... Uh, well, I was working on Big Apple, which was a detective show, a David Milch show, um, which was a, you know, he's a very successful producer. So I, I was designing Tick, Tick, Boom while I was working on the TV show. And then um, Tick, Tick, Boom was quite a bit of, of a success, you know, and uh, Raul Esparza was the star of it. And Amy Spanger and Jerry Dixon, all great Broadway yeah. veterans. Uh, and then 9-11 happened. Yep. which was in the September of that year. We had opened it in June. And so after sept September 11th, everything downtown pretty much shut down. And we were right. downtown at, a, at the Jane Street Theater. So um, that that's, uh, really was a, a bad time. Oh, yeah. Everything closed. Um, and then Scott and I, at least, I met a director who really was an up-and-coming talent and uh, so after that, we, we kept our association. We started working on things together. We did, uh, we did uh, plays, we did regional theater productions. And um, so it was very, uh, it was, I felt like I finally met a director that I was, uh, had a great relationship with. And that's very important, I think. Right. In this business is the, the way designers get work is their associations with directors because Design. If you're friends with other designers, you're not going to get work from other designers because you're it's you're working. Right. Yeah, you're you're looking for the same they thing. Those jobs. <laughs> you know, for the longest time when I was working as an assistant, I have to say this because in my mind, I thought if I work for a big designer and I'm their assistant, someday they'll let me design something. But it doesn't work that way. Uh -uh. <laughs> There's no way it's going to work that way. You might meet fellow assistant costume designers or an assistant lighting designer, those are the people you want to form associations with because, right. and, and assistant directors, because well, once you, when you work around that circle of people who are working for the successful, you know, working directors, those are the, those are the associations you need to create because one of these people is going to get an opportunity, especially if a director gets the opportunity to do something you have a relationship with those people and you can end up forming great teams, creative teams together. And you can go all the way back to that student production. That's, That's right. Exactly what that is, right? I mean, you found people in the school who had the different disciplines and said, let's work together and collaborate. And now legitimately, I mean, you all played off of each other and are all successful. So that's, that's exactly a big part of it. Find people who you recognize talent in and, and go to them. That's Pretty it. Friendly. That's the, that's the key. Yeah. Yeah. And show them you have talent. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and sometimes you made a good point when earlier when you said, you know, I took this, this job and took a cut in pay. 
Oh yeah. It's I okay to realize. That, yeah. And sometimes that's what you have to do. Um, you know, it's, if you, if you see a, it, the off off Broadway stuff, it, it's more work, it's less budget, it's less pay, but those relationships are much more important in the payoff. Yeah, I mean, that's it's true. true. It's true. I mean, I know that, um, in this day and age, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, interns not getting paid and people right. getting paid a fair wage, which I understand, of course I do. Um, but for me at the time, you know, wanting the experience was the most important thing for me, more than getting paid. I wanted to be able to you know, prove myself. And sometimes, you know, you've got to sacrifice, I think. It, it doesn't, you know, it turned out okay, in other words. I, and the other thing was, I had another job, you know. I didn't rely on working for designers as my, as my bread and butter, because I knew right. it was in the arts. It's very hard to earn a living in the arts. So you can't expect suddenly to get like, you know, you know, full wage and compensation just because you've decided you're an artist. You can't, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> That's know? exactly right. It's not an essential service, uh, especially in these yeah. days, you know. So, yeah. so I felt like I, my, my willingness to work for someone to show them that I, I wanted to be able to prove myself. And plus, a lot of times I said yes to things that I wasn't completely capable of doing or I knew I could, I just had never done it before. So. Um, if it took me all night to figure out how to do it and I would show up the next morning and say here and they would say, oh, was it hard? I would say, no, it wasn't that hard. <laughs> yeah. And students, what you're hearing, these are the attributes. When I asked the questions before of Anna, uh, why do you think they let you in the program? Why do you think they let you in again? Why do you think you got this work? What she is now verbalizing are the attributes that the others, saw. you know, we said they saw something. Mm. If you, even if you want to go back and listen to the last two or three minutes, what she talked about, those are the attributes she saw. And if you study successful people, those are the attributes of successful people. Well, if you want to distinguish yourself, you've got to be able That's to. That's what you have to do. You have to be able to stand, you know. Yeah. Stand out talent, somewhere. Talent is good. And she's obviously talented. You are obviously talented because I've seen some of your work and I don't care how, how <laughs> stick to it you are. If you don't have talent, you can't do what you've done. Well. But talent alone isn't enough, especially when you get to New York City, because it's full of talented people. That's right. And it's those who put in the work that are going to rise to the top. That's right. That's true. Yeah. So well done, ma'am. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's only taken me 30 plus years, but okay. Hey, hey, I'm 50. <laughs> I've been designing for that long and almost, and I'm still in Ada, Oklahoma, but that's okay. Hey. I like my sets here. People here need good sets too. Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. You bet. Oh, that's awesome. Um, well, very good. So where are we in the journey here? We've got, uh, we we are, oh, you're tick, designing boom, for Scott. Yes. Tick, tick, boom. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, and then, uh, when did it happen? Well, a couple of years later, uh, uh, the producers of Avenue Q, we're, we're uh, they have this little show, Avenue Q. Just a little puppet show. Just a little puppet show that was going to be a co-production with the new group, which is an off-Broadway uh, theater company and the Vineyard Theater, two off-Broadway, you know, part of the legitimate off-Broadway um, theater companies. Um, and some with some commercial producers in the background just to kind of be there to support it. Um, Robin Goodman, Jeffrey Seller, Kevin McCollum, three people that you will hear about later <laughs> as well. Um, and uh, the the director that, the, that they tapped for the show was someone that I had actually met. His name is Jason Moore. And we were going to do a show together. A friend, someone who recommended him to me because he, he was attached to a play, uh, came and met me. And we started to develop this play together. Um, a couple months later, he had uh, he, he opted out from directing that play because he, he couldn't get the playwright to do the changes that he wanted. But I ended up doing that play anyway. And in any case, he remembered me. And when we were, when they, he was tapped to do Avenue Q, he recommended me. So um, I was very thrilled about that, obviously. No doubt, yeah. And, but the play, the, the, the show was still kind of being written. It wasn't complete. So it, they, they did a workshop up at the O'Neill Center 
uh, over the summer, which is a place where new work can be developed. You know, playwrights and composers, they go up there and they spend the whole summer up there in this beautiful campus where they can um, work on their stuff and then present it for a weekend. And so we went up for the presentation and uh, it was in pretty good shape. And then they decided to do it at the vineyard. We did, we performed it at the vineyard. So that was my first, my second commercial off-Broadway show. Um, and that was very, was, we knew we had something special. And, uh, and when the audiences started coming in, we weren't sure. But once the, within the first, a different. within the first, you know, 30 <laughs> seconds of that play, when the oh, audience yeah. laughs, the last you know. keep going, the last keep going. So we knew we had something special. Yeah, it is. It is definitely special. Yeah. And while I was doing that, though, then I jumping back to when I said I got the job at Sex in the City, that that coincided with with me finishing Avenue Q and it was up and running pretty much. We were in tech when I got the job for Sex in the City and that was during the summer. So we were gearing up to start Sex in the City that fall. No, I'm sorry. Uh uh, no, we had already opened uh, Avenue Q. Yes, and then during this, during the course of the summer, I was working on Sex in the City. We were shooting episodes, um, and the show did very well. It ran this the season. They extended it at the Vineyard, and then the producers decided they wanted to move it to Broadway, which was you know un unthinkable, of course, because that had, <laughs> a puppet show on Broadway was uh, inconceivable, especially one that was a little. Um, a little racy. A little racy. Yeah. But once that decision was made, uh, I had to make the decision to leave TV. Right. Because I, I, I didn't want to give up. Yeah. Yeah. It, and there was no, for me, there was no question. My right. first Broadway show, I'm not going to give that up. Absolutely going to be there. Yep. <laughs> so, um, and that was 2003. Okay. So, so from the time I graduated NYU, which was 1989 to 2003, that's the span of time it took for me to finally get, you know, what I consider a successful show. How many years is that? Two or three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, the, and of course, you know, that whole season, all these shows came up. Wicked opened, uh, Taboo, Carolina Change, all these musicals. And, um, you know, the chance of Avenue Q winning Best Musical, you know, considering that Wicked was the big one that year. Right. Uh, we surprised everybody, and including me. <laughs> I was totally surprised. <laughs> but it was great that we won the Tony Award for Best Musical that year. And then, you know, it ran for uh, Broadway. And then after we closed, after we closed on Broadway, we did the unthinkable thing and moved back off Broadway. Right which had never happened to anyone before. No one even thought about doing that. We moved it off Broadway. So the show ran for another, I don't know, 10, I mean, it was like 13, 14 years we ran. So- um, Phenomenal it's, run. It's one of those shows that just, it still resolutes even now. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's still being done all over. Yeah. 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 I um, went to a production of it in Tulsa last year, last uh -huh. year, I believe. One of my good friends from college who, you know, it's one of those things he um, did, uh, we did Fiddler on the Roof. I was uh, Tevye and he was Lazar Wolf. And then uh -huh. he never did anything again. And then on a whim decided he'd audition and he got Brian. In, <laughs> uh, an equity production of, of, of Avenue Q. Wow. wow. Uh, it was typecasting. His name is even Brian. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, very good. And, and so after Avenue Q, everything just started pouring in and you had to relax and take life no. <laughs> no, but, but it worked that way. <laughs> no, but I, I um, you know, it, it, once you once they notice that you have done something that's noticeable, then they think, oh, you know what you're doing, I guess, and maybe we'll find, you know, maybe we'll get to. They don't always have the imagination. Producers always don't have the imagination to think that you're capable of doing a lot of things. They right. think. Well, who did the realistic show last year? Let's hire that person to do this realistic show. Or who did the musical that? You know, let's hire them. Whoever did that, let's have them do this. And on Broadway, you don't necessarily want to be pigeonholed as who did the puppet show. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Not a lot of follow-up opportunity. <laughs> right. Yeah. But um, luckily, uh, one of the producers of uh, Avenue Q, well, Kevin McCollum, he was spearheading a revival of um, 
well, not a revival, an original stage production of White Christmas, Irving Berlin's White Christmas. Yeah. And um, so he uh, wanted me, to, he asked me if I wanted to do it and if I would meet with the director. So I met with the director, I read the script and it was a completely different kind of show from uh, Avenue Q. It's a multi-set, old fashioned musical. All I was the great say, did they do it in the kind of the grandiose old Broadway style? It had to. I mean, be, when yeah. you read the script, it's like, you know, there's yeah. there's a nightclub, there's a train, yep. there's the inn, there's this uh there's the dingy nightclub, there are dressing rooms, there's a telephone uh, operator booth, there's a swanky New York nightclub, there's a barn, there's the show in the barn, there's a lot of scenery. It's just almost building movie sets, isn't it? It read like a movie, yeah, and and it had to flow like a movie. So, um, and that is something I had worked as an associate on big musicals. I worked on, you know, Whistle Down the Wind, Scarlet Pimpernel. So I had to figure out how scenery moved. That yeah. was my job, and uh, I knew from experience over the years how you can make things move on stage so that they look effortless, and also how to create stage pictures by combining three-dimensional pieces and flat pieces and soft pieces so that you're layering a lot of interesting visual elements so that when the audience sits back and looks at the picture, they put it together in their heads and they go, ah, oh, I know where I am. Yeah, I it see. Good depth. Yeah, so, so this one was a challenge. And I, I don't know, I just jumped right in and I, and I talked with Walter Bobby, who was the director. We really figured out the visual language for this show and, um, you know, some of the scenes were small, some of the scenes were big. And so how did I do that? I, it, for some reason in my head for this particular show, I kept thinking it had to iris down. You know, when you iris down something, that means you need to create these little pictures like that. Like for the dressing rooms, I didn't need the whole stage. I just need a little picture. So I did an irising portal, which is basically mm -hmm. a drop that comes down and two legs that travel this way. But they were telescoping legs because they needed to come all the way to center. So you needed like two of them. Right. So they would go like that, and they yeah. would go like that. And they could also go like this and like that. And so you could create these little pictures. So the dressing room, there were scenes where the girls are in their dressing rooms and the boys are in their dressing rooms. So first you expose the girls, and then you slide it open, and you see the boys. So you had the two split scenes like that. And there were a couple of moments like that in the, in the musical where we had to have split scenes. So the, the irising portal worked very well for that. But also it allowed us to, and, and in those little scenes, there were wagons that tracked on that were complete. So they had walls in them and you, you could enclose them completely. And when we wanted to go to the big scenes after that, we would, we would just track the wagons off and open up the irising portal and then the other scene was already Ooh, there. there it was, revealed. And that's, that's kind of half, that's, that's what you have to figure out. And yeah. I love trying to figure that part. Oh, that's, that's yeah, you really, you know, we talk about having tracks for the actors and everybody has a track backstage. You're frig figuring the track for for the entire story, the vision, the visual track, I guess. Right. Is a, is yeah. A, and, 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 and the logistics of it all is when these go off, is there room off stage for them to go? And do we have to fly them out once they go off stage? Sometimes they have like chain motors where they pull things right. up in the air. Because Broadway theaters are not that big, by the way. Right. They're, they're pretty small. And uh, because they were built, you know, the early 1900s. I mean, yeah, like, like 1910, 1920. Yeah, so, they didn't plan but, on having helicopters in there like in Miss Saigon and things like exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> you know, painted flats, basically. Exactly, yeah. <clears throat> So, you know, people have, have come up with innovative, innovative ways to um, store scenery. Yeah. Know. So anyway, um, we, we, did, uh, we did White Christmas. We tried it out in San Francisco that, that year. It was done in San Francisco. And then the following year, Kevin wanted to do multiple productions. So we did three separate productions of White Christmas, starting wow. in different cities. We had one in San Francisco, one in L.A., and one in Boston. And with this grandiose set. Yeah, and so they Amazing. built it three times. It was it was really uh, ambitious. Yeah. So, and then in the meantime, I worked again with Scott on a production of The Foreigner with uh, Matthew Roderick that was done at the Roundabout Theater. So that was a unit set. It was a you know a cabin, a, a big cabin. Um, and so I started getting you know different jobs in that sense. And so and each job you know would span period of time for at least six months. So 
I had these chunks of time devoted to different different projects. And then um, um, uh, another director, Scott Ellis, uh, approached me with this n new Candor and Ebb musical that had never been produced before called Curtains. And um, uh, we we started working on that together. And so that was a, and that was going to be going to Los Angeles. And then shortly after that, uh, this other musical that Kevin McCollum and Jeffrey and Robin was were involved with was called In the Heights. Yeah, and that's that's another musical which is that's completely that. different from Curtains. Curtains was another old-fashioned musical with multiple sets. In the Heights was a unit set, basically, right. um, where I had to design a neighborhood, um, which you know very well-known neighborhood, Washington Heights, that right. has the distinction of being up, up north in Manhattan. And um, so I was, those were, those kind of overlapped. Um, but um, still I had, I had hired people to work for me by then. I knew how to manage a staff because I had had the experience as an associate designer, knowing how to break up the job and figure out who's going to do what. Um, so all of those things kind of built, built up towards I don't know, like a, a body of knowledge that I, I've acquired yeah. from all the different jobs that I had um, and figuring out how to organize, because that's a big part of what I have to do, is organizing my time uh, and assigning different jobs to people so that we could all have, you know, land around the same time right. together. It's a choreography, isn't it, of time and, and knowledge? Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yes. So, so um, talk about <laughs> puzzle, yeah. Uh, so one of the things I wanna I wanna ask about Anna, because uh, you and and you know I would encourage people to go um, find your website and just look at your resume and all of the the shows, the wonderful shows you've worked on. Um, School of Rock, I noticed you are also the costume designer, right? Mm -hmm. And you also have to your credits projections, and I don't remember which which it play was for you Honeymoon in Vegas. Honeymoon in Vegas, right. Yeah. So were those just a whim, hey, I wanna do this, or did they say, hey, you know, can you design these as well, or? Well, for School of Rock, um, it, was, it, was, it was asked of me. It was, okay. um, it was asked of me because in, in England, in British theater, most often, the designer who does the set also does the costumes. It's, really? it's very common. Yeah, it's very common in, in England for, you know, West End productions. Usually it's the set and costume designer. Because huh. uh, they figure, it, they could, they consider it a whole. Right. And, and That's it's true. true. It, it you know, is Stylistically, true. It's, true. A, it's a whole. Um, and so because the director was British and Andrew was, you know, obviously British, um, and he, he was one of the producers, um, the general manager, who was the person who, in charge of the, kind of managing the finances of the show. Um, once I got the job, um, after, it was kind of an after, after the fact. I got the job as the set designer. She called me the next day and said, by the way, do you do costumes? And I said, yes. She <laughs> said, <laughs> because, um, you know, they, they would rather the same person do the set and costumes. And I right. said, yes, of course I can. Yes, I can. Not something I would normally, uh, up, um, asked to do right because doing the set is enough for me it's a lot and and also you know my training from for costume design was from graduate school right honestly um but because i knew this was a contemporary musical i knew it was kids in uniforms um, it wasn't cats yeah i knew that i could man <laughs> i i i knew at least that i had the taste yes and and the um, aesthetic to manage that that kind of costume design. So I, I did say yes to that. Yeah. Which was, and it was great because it could, I could all, it was all together. And I, and I hired really good associates right. and really good uh, assistants for, to help me uh, manage all the fittings and all that stuff. But it's a yeah. lot. To have and, to create the costumes from the ground up, you know, like a period show, I would probably say no. Right. Absolutely. And yeah, because that makes sense. I've been to shows where the scenic designer and the costume designer obviously didn't collaborate or talk. Uh -huh. And I don't know how it was at one show where literally the, the characters almost like they were wearing camouflage because the, they just wow. melted into the scenery. You, 
you lost them almost. It was a fiasco. So yes, they are very much a collaborative design effort yes. in successfulness. Yes, and at least they could have spoken before they. Yeah, that's executed what I thought. <laughs> Did you not have a dress rehearsal or, I yeah. mean, even before that, but yeah. Yeah. I it mean, was... I just did a, last spring I did a, a musical called um, Scotland PA at the Roundabout Theater. Okay. And I, the, the costume designer, Tracy Christensen, Christensen and I had a conversation because of my, uh, it's about a, a, a fast food restaurant that uh, transforms from a cheap burger joint to something that almost is akin to McDonald's, you know, a fa fancy restaurant. Um, and it's red and yellow. Everything in the restaurant transforms to red uh -huh. and yellow. And she, she said, what color red are you using? Because I have it on my uniforms. I don't want them to blend into the walls. Yes. So it, it was a whole discussion about what shade of red are you using versus what shade of red is she using? So color and, you know, costume and set can... They, they need important. to coordinate. Yeah. 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 Yes. That's and oh, good. you were asking about projection design. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we did Honeymoon in Vegas uh, at the um, uh, Paper Mill Playhouse in New Jersey first. It was a, and that's a big musical theater space. I don't know if you've, you're familiar with the Paper Mill Playhouse, but they, they have a great reputation. They've, they've been around for years, and lately they've become kind of a, launching point for shows to move to Broadway. Newsies right. started there. Ah. Uh, yeah. And Honeymoon in Vegas was uh, uh, one of the musicals that we did there. And it's an incredible team of people. Jason Robert Brown wrote the score. And um, we had a, a great team of uh, creatives on it. And um, Howell Binkley was the lighting designer. And uh, yeah, the great Howell. Yeah. And Hal and I have worked on many, many shows together. So this was just one more show. And it, it was uh, the, the, the thing that distinguishes the paper mill playhouse is it's very big. It's a big space, like a barn. Uh, of course, when they decided to move it to Broadway, we got the Niederlander Theater, which was 15 feet shallower than wow. what, we, what we had in, uh, in New Jersey. And the producers said, well, now that we have uh, a Broadway theater, we want to do more. We want more scenery. <laughs> wanna, so we, more we, in a smaller space. Yeah. I mean, Brilliant. you know, the whole yeah. intro was, you know, uh, the, the character walking around in Brooklyn and talking about his neighborhood and his girlfriend. And then they go to Tiffany and they ride the subway and all these things. And it was just sung in the song for, for good for, for, for the paper mill playhouse. But now that we were in Broadway, they wanted me to flesh out all those places. And I, with 15 feet less space. <laughs> so I said, there's no way I can do that unless, unless we define a certain part of the set as being uh, projection surfaces or, or LED screens. Ultimately, we, we realized, I decided LED screens make sense because you can change the program and you don't have to worry about people casting shadows. Right. So well, and if it's it's such a shallow theater, you don't have a lot of throw space with the angles right and things as well. You're limited in, in that. Well, and if you're shooting from the house, there's going to be people in front of it. There are, yeah. And that means you can't flesh out the image until it lands. And right. what I wanted to do is have tracking LED screens. So, nice. so there was a whole center part, and plus they wanted the orchestra to be visible on stage, but they also wanted the orchestra to go away. So that means they, they had to be on stage. So that takes up space. Right. So um, I came up with a whole plan where the audience, the, the, the orchestra was split up into three, three sections. Two of the sections would go like, it would be all the way upstage like that. And they would track off and then the middle section would come like that. So they would all line up in the back. That was one solution. And then the rest of it was halfway upstage. I had these two huge LED screen units that would track on, but they weren't full height. They were halfway up. They're about 10 feet tall. They came like that. And then all the way in the back was another section of LED screens that filled the picture. And so I would turn the, these, these two tracking LED walls into many things. They were storefronts for Brooklyn. And, and then I would fly in a section that had like rooftops and stuff that would land on top of it. So it was a combination of three dimensional pieces and virtual pieces so that and layered pieces so so that when the audience looked at the picture they weren't just looking at a screen 
because that looks awful. To me, it Absolutely. just looks boring. And So uh, sometimes we would track in pieces downstage of the, uh, of the LED screen so the actors could interact with things. So, for example, Tiffany, the, the Tiffany store, we had jewelry counters, and we had the background, um, and uh, we flew in a Tiffany sign. So, so it was a lot of those kinds of things that uh, established the visual language for, for Honeymoon. And so the content had to be created. That's what I was, my point was. Right, yeah. Somebody had to make it. Yeah, so I couldn't hire some outside person. I wanted it to look like scenery. Yeah, it was your vision. It had to look like the scenery. So stylistically, aesthetically, it had to match all of the, the, the real pieces. So that's when I realized, oh, we have to design every single image. So yeah. um, I had a wonderful assistant who was really good uh, with, uh, with her Photoshop. And so we would take some realistic textures, like the bricks and various things, and we would in, uh, incorporate them into some of these images. And uh, and then the other thing that we didn't realize it was it was a it was a process of discovery. There's a whole scene where they go to Hawaii, and there's the house, the Hawaii house. So we created this house. It looks like you know it's on a hillside, and the, the we have the, the projection screen in the back that also had uh, you know the the clouds. And then I flew in the roof part of the house that basically lived on top of these LED screens. So there was some three-dimensional things. But then it was the daytime for one of the scenes, and then it was nighttime for the other scene. So we had to create a completely different look for the nighttime scene. So you can't suddenly let the lighting change the image because it's not a lighting question, it's an image question. So Hal had to match his lighting to my images too. So it was a lot, but it, yeah. I, I, was really, I was really happy with the result. Yeah, no, and and the the things that are being done with projection today are are just phenomenal. You know, I mean, it's it's opening up possibilities for so many different things that were you couldn't do before. Um, yeah, I was looking at some new technology. It's it was new to me uh, just today, even um, that I would love to get from my classroom. It's a it's a it's a three D scanning video projector that reads the Im reads the space in front of it. So then it can precisely project mm. parts of an image on things. Like so projected it, mapping. It's, it's, it's what it is, yeah. it's projected mapping. Mm -hmm. So uh, as soon as I saw that, I thought in my room, because there's a small one that'd be great, I'm like, I could, I've, I've got boxes, I can put those and I can then Turn project. them into anything. I can turn my little, I built a little eight by eight stage for my students and I'm, you know, I'm trying to get lighting for it, but I'm thinking, man, with this, I can turn that stage for them into anything. Yeah. How incredible is that, right? In this yeah. little bitty space to be able to do that kind of thing. I thought, geez, it Pretty just great. so much fun. So much can you fun. Do, can you do it with one projector or do you need multiple projectors? Uh, with one. Not. Really? With one, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and you know, you, you think about things like that. that uh, to me, what's great about that technology is, you know, five years ago, that's a $40,000 unit, right? Oh, yeah. It's getting now cheap. it's like $2,500. Yeah, for the projector wow. with the built-in scanner. It's a small That's amazing. Unit. Boom. It's crazy. You know, obviously you couldn't do a Broadway show with that one, mm -hmm. but um, you, you, they, they have them big enough to do that. And, you know, being able to scale it down for any size just opens up what anyone can do. Yeah. What anyone can do. Yeah. And that's, that's beautiful. Well, the technology is making, it's, it's giving access to people with more sophisticated tools yeah. So that it's not just confined to, you know, the upper echelons of the business, you know, which is great. Yes. That's why we expect you guys at the upper echelon to just kill it and show us what it can do. <laughs> <laughs> no, you are uh, inspiring for sure. Um, well, we're getting short on time. I, I know I wish we, we had. I wish we had more, more, maybe should do two or three episodes with you. You could be my first yeah, multi episode. Yeah, <laughs> this is, this is part forever. one. Yes, <laughs> but there, there are some things that I, um, I, of course, like to do with everyone. And uh, first of all, before I, I would be remiss if I just didn't give you the opportunity. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you feel would just be key information for a student who is thinking, I enjoy design, I enjoy seating design. You know, think back when you were in high school, if you'd known that that's what you're going into. What were some things that would be a great 
place for them to really build some foundation? Um, well, obviously, it depends on where you live, I think. Right. You know, if there if there's nobody, if there's no one you could, you know, help out, like say there's an, an adult who's creating something, who's designing something or building something. If there's someone like that around, you should offer your services, you know, volunteer, help out, see what it takes to put together a, a, a show, see what it takes to put together the lights, to pro, you know, to to, you know, hook up the lights and programming, sit, you know, get get opportunities like that to watch how other people do do what you're interested in doing and um, offer your help whenever you can if you and do it for free if you can because most people can't afford to do theater anyway it's it's not a, absolutely right it's not a huge money-making enterprise for most people um, and if you're at a place where you are uh, you are a, ca able to design say yes to as many jobs as you can that's what I did for a long time I, I just said yes to everything that I could. Um, and then um, have some, learn some good skills if you can. Take some computer drawing classes. But if you can draw by hand, uh, practice that. It's really, yeah. really, it's a really helpful tool. I know that computers are taking over, but I think it's really, if you don't have a basic understanding, I think having hand eye coordination is really important. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's an important tool and you shouldn't give it up. If, if you, I know that computers can be really easy and, you know, putting together pretty pictures is great, but you have to also understand how it gets built from the ground up. You, yeah. you know, you might conceive these great, beautiful images and, you know, piece together in Photoshop some fabulous looking concept. But it's important for you to understand how you fit it all in the space on stage because because that's not going to change. The space right. is very, that's a, that's a finite thing. So um, you got to make it work. If you can't make it work in the box, then it's just a fantasy. Yep. So, um, I mean, that's, I, I, I hate to, I don't want to squelch people's creativity, no. but I think what happens in a lot of these, uh, you know, in, even in graduate school, you can, con you can conceive all kinds of great ideas. But, but to me, the best learning I did was once I was out, out in the real world and I saw what you have to put up with when you go into a theater. It's not just you out there. You have lighting. You have to provide space for the lighting designer. You have to pro provide space for the sound designer. You have to find out. Sometimes they want to put speakers right in the middle of your scenery and you have to have a negotiation. <laughs> and, um, you know, those are, those, those are the kinds of conversations that uh, you discover you have to have when you're really in the business. And, yeah. and, and you're really trying to make things work. And it's a very collaborative business where you all have to sit in the room together and figure it out together. So um, that's a little jumping ahead. But if you're just starting out, um, you know, say yes to whatever you can. Um, and if you are at a place where you can design something, try to, if, you, if, if there's any work that you see, like if you see a, a, a play and you love the way it's been done, try to meet the director. Yeah. Send a, send a, send an email to the find the contact to the director's name and email the director and say I really loved the production. Is there any way you'd be interested in uh, meeting a designer, or or if you like the design, reach out to the designer and say I I would love to work with you someday. If I'd love to, to you know be an assistant at, or um, uh, let me work as an intern. I'll work for free. You know anything like that you can do to ingratiate yourself with any of these people that you admire and respect is very helpful. That's how people found me, I have to tell you. I get these emails from people that said, I really would love to work for you. I, I love your show. Um, I, I'd be, you know, I'm happy to come. I would love to meet you. Uh, I offer you, let's, I, I'll come and I'll come to your studio. I'll meet you for a cup of coffee, anything like that you can uh, do. But don't be afraid to reach out to people. I'm telling you, that's, that's how I meet a lot of my assistants. They just call me out of the blue. Here's a, here's a great example. You just You're, did that. <laughs> I did. You're on our show today because I was in, um, we're both members of a Scenic Design Facebook group. Uh -huh. And we both had, our comments were, I think you actually commented on something I posted or there was something. And I was, and I, when people do that, I always go through and say, who, you know, I just look, who are they? Huh. And 
I realized who you were. So of course, right. My huh. mom always said it never hurts to ask. And so that's I right. sent you a message and, and you responded and said, I would love to. And that's, that's it. I mean, that's, that's what it. you've got to be willing to go out. You're going to get a lot of people that don't respond. You're going to get a lot of no's. Yeah. You know what? It doesn't take many yeses to really begin to get somewhere. Yeah. And that's the thing I wish I had known when I was younger. Yeah. I thought everybody was way beyond my reach, way beyond my reach. There's no way they're going to talk to me. How do I even, I wouldn't even know how to find those people. But yeah. now with the social media, it's actually possible in, may, in ways that never was when I was a kid. You'd have to like look up in a phone book or something <laughs> when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. Kids Google what a phone book is. So you can... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Absolutely. So, yeah. So, so it, uh, yeah. It's Don't true. Don't be afraid. Yeah. And, and especially right now, the world isn't a place that's never been and knock on wood, if I had any, hopefully we'll never be again, but people are accessible and, and, and people, what I've found through this series is people who are really talented. Number one, I have not run into any ego um, amongst any of the people that are working professionally. And I'm sure there is some, Yeah, but most of them love the art so much and want to pass on knowledge. They do. That's true. No, I, I agree with you. I think it's so true. And most of the people I, I work with are good people. They're nice people. They're generous people. And the ones you want to work with, you know, these yeah. are the people you want to work with. And uh, we find each other and we love working together. So we always try to find ways to work together. That's it. The wall of wisdom is full of my <laughs> guests saying, be nice. Yeah. Be nice. You've got to be nice. This is a, uh, it's a small community. You it's will be It's a very remembered. small community. It's true. Yeah. And if you burn bridges, uh, people remember. And if you're not a good person, yeah. they remember. And, you know, it's things get around. People, people know. Yep. We all know each other. So that's true. Yes. It's absolutely true. Well, dang it, we're gonna have to bring this to a close. I thoroughly enjoy this. I told you this is I, I love all of my guests, I love all of my interviews, but when it's someone who does what I do, I mean it's just you know, <laughs> I just uh, right. yeah. I mean I, I do I want to pull out my design and say, and hey, what do you think of these? What do you think <laughs> I'm not gonna do that to you? I know that's like ah. but um We've got a couple more things. One of those is my, it's my guilty pleasure of this. I'm a passionate person and I love hearing uh, what I call people's passion statement. Um, you obviously love what you do or you would yeah. not have done so much for free and you would not have just doggedly, no, stick to itiveness would not have yeah. been. Um, it's the word of the episode if we were a Pee Wee Herbert show. <laughs> um, but can that be my word of wisdom? It, if, if you want it to be, it, absolutely, yeah. So uh, when we get, we get to the wall, but first you got to tell me passion. What is it that if you can kind of narrow it down to one or two things, what is it that really just gets you up and excited and and about a, about a project, about what you do, this this whole thing? I I guess I love to. Um, well, I get very excited when there's a new something new for me to work yeah. on, a new play, a new musical, because suddenly there's this whole new world that's about to open up, and I get to be part of conjuring up this world in a way that, that will draw the audience in when yeah. they see it on stage. So uh, that, I don't know that's, that's it. it. No, I do understand because that's I'm the same. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, when I design, I get so excited about the ability to give my actors a space that will give them the ability to do best, the best they can. That's it. Yeah. And the actors and making it make it work for the actors is also really important. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of actors have said that to me. They they often compliment the fact that it, they, they feel huge. happy that they have something around them. And I think that's probably because I, I studied acting. I think that yeah. has been a very part of what helps me when I imagine what it's like to be on stage and what I yeah. imagine what it is for the actors. I don't want to give them something where it's like all about the set and not about the people on it. So if, if um, you have distracted to the point where people went, oh, this set's amazing and they miss the show, then as a designer, you've missed the mark. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, and I also think here's another. These are all yeah. little nuggets. Trans <laughs> <laughs> in a multi-set musical or play, the transitions are as much a part of your responsibility as a designer, and an opportunity for to continue the storytelling. That's absolutely right. 
So if that's ever possible, always go for that. Always try to make your transitions part of the storytelling. Yeah. Yep. I love it. All right. So wall of wisdom, your opportunity. And I know this is the whole reason you wanted to be on the show. You probably heard about <laughs> us and you're like, oh, I got to get on the wall of wisdom. I got to be immortalized. I tell people your, your nugget of wisdom will be on the wall until a tornado hits my trailer and it's gone. But then it will be spread all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've, I've, I feel like I've given you, I've, I've said several things. You have. There's been, I could create, we could create our own uh, Ana Luisa's wall of wisdom, right? <laughs> but you're going to have to pick uh, one because it's not that big a piece of gaff tape, Anna. Oh, oh, I know it's God. tough, but what's, what do you think it should be? What should we uh. do? And it can be stick to because that would be fun to try to spell. <laughs> I think uh, I got it, though. I think, uh, yeah, I think stick to is a you big one. Because we, we, yeah, I think All so. All right. All right. Well, here goes. This would be like super califragilistic XBL. <laughs> stick. My wife, luckily, is a first grade reading teacher. Okay. So hooked on phonics worked for me. Okay. T I V E in there. Tua. T U A, right? You think? No, to I. To it. To itiveness. T. Oh, because if I can to it stick. Yeah. To it. To it. To I. T I V E N E S S. There you go. <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, stick to itiveness. I even fit it all on there. Oh, wow. Good. With room to, with an exclam I can even put an exclamation point. Please do. <laughs> it needs it. That's good. No, I like it. That may be my new favorite <laughs> nugget of wisdom. I think someday I'll do a t-shirt with all of the, the wisdom on there. Oh, that's a good idea. We have a new wall coming. Uh-huh. That's bigger because I've filled up that. Yep, it's it's a flat pretty, up. pretty full. Stick to itiveness. <sighs> Boom. All right. All right. And we're going to put you right here. Oh. Lose my headphones. Thick intuitiveness. Boom. Right there. You're All the right. foundation. Mm. Everything Good. else. Is done. <laughs> <laughs> so that's great. Well, the final piece here, and this is something that I do for all of my guests because you are hidden stars, and meaning at the end of the shows that you design, you don't get to go out for a curtain call, which is so unfair because you deserve it. <laughs> you are such a big part of. <clears throat> the magic happen and making what we love happen and we will love you forever for that um and so this is your curtain call so what you have to do is this is suspension of disbelief that i represent all of the fandom of musical theater anna and so your your curtain call here and so this is for you uh, Ooh, yay <laughs> thank you <laughs> so 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 well deserved um, thank you. Thank you for being on the show, for taking the time to to answer a crazy message from a crazy man <laughs> Facebook and say yes and bless me with this opportunity and bless our students with your knowledge. Thank you for being who you are, what you do. My pleasure, Jamie. It's been great. It's really great. Oh, well, thank good. You. Good, good, good. Well, the, it, the privilege is all ours and, and the pleasure is ours. And I'll, I'll give a little teaser here to our listeners. There's going to be another bonus video that um, will be shorter, but it will be Anna sharing her design process. So uh, it's going to be worth everyone listening. But if you are a student of scenic design or you think that's something you want to do, you're definitely going to listen because um, she knows what she's doing. I'm telling you, she does. It's obvious in her sets. Uh, so you'll want to watch that as well. But other than that, that is our episode today. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, we do this for you. Go make art, um, whatever it is. And, and let me echo, as a scenic designer myself as well, and as a drama high school drama teacher, and as a board member of, uh, of a community theater group, we're always looking for people. Let me tell you, if you go to your <laughs> high school teacher who is in charge of the drama program and you say, I think I would like to design a show, <laughs> they will probably just grab you and hug you. <laughs> they usually do it all. And, uh, and, and they would love for you to do that. I guarantee you the opportunities will just pour in and you will be the better for it. And it, it will be a great 
place to start. So let me encourage you, don't be afraid of it. Um, even if all you can do is do rough sketches on a piece of paper, it is a place to start. Don't stay there, better yourself, but do it. And it may take you all the way to where our wonderful guest today is. Um, and, and it may not. Now, what to be, I'll get on a soapbox for just a second. <clears throat> yeah. For me, it didn't. For me, it took me to working with <clears throat> incredibly talented people in a community theater, occasionally being contracted with a university. But let me tell you, it is still as rewarding um, to, to design a show, to put it up, and to sit back and see what you've done fleshed out and have incredible art happening on it. So don't be discouraged if you decide to do something else in life. If you love doing it, keep doing it wherever you are on whatever level. It's still art and you will still be appreciated for it. So fulfilling, it's fulfilling. Great advice. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Occasionally I have a little something. I don't have anything on the wall yet. I'm not that way, <laughs> but you know. Oh, I'm uh, sure you very, have many. <laughs> many, M-I-N-I, -I, maybe. Yes. <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, guys, thank you. Love you guys. We'll see you next time right here on the Hidden Stars of Theater. That is our show. I'm going to kill the lights. Turn on the ghost light. That's it. See you, everybody. <laughs>